Hello, I'm David Murphy, the 2019-20 President of the British Psychological Society. In response to the current coronavirus pandemic, the Society established a group to coordinate the contribution of psychology and psychologists to managing the crisis. This group has established a number of work streams, information about which is available at www.bps.org.uk forward slash responding hyphen coronavirus. One of the work streams established is focused on the psychological needs of staff during the pandemic and involved establishing an expert group led by Dr Judy Highfield and myself and comprised of clinical, counselling, health and occupational psychologists with expertise in critical care, coping with epidemics and healthcare staff wellbeing. We also had input from other clinical advisors and a psychiatrist, Professor Bob Maunder, who's an expert on the impact of epidemics on healthcare staff. On 31st of March, we published a guidance document that was particularly tailored to healthcare managers and clinical leaders. It explained the psychological needs of staff during the crisis and outlined some simple steps to be taken in order to protect psychological well-being. Julie and I also recorded an hour-long webinar to support implementation of the guidance, which is available to view on demand by following the link shown on the screen. As a follow-up to the webinar, we held a small group discussion with members of the BPS expert group and a range of healthcare staff who are directly involved in responding to the coronavirus pandemic in the UK to talk about the psychological needs of staff and practical aspects of implementing the guidance across different settings. I'd strongly encourage you to, for, to watch the whole of the previous webinar, but I'll just briefly outline the three phases of psychological responses that we refer to in the guidance. These are the preparation, action and recovery phases. The preparation phase is characterised by anticipatory anxiety but also by excitement. Most UK health organisations have already passed through this phase. The second phase is the action phase, which is characterised by a rush of energy and a focus on getting things done. A great deal can be accomplished in this phase, but there's also a risk of inadequate communication, poor decision making and silo working. As the action phase continues, the going gets much tougher and there's an increasing risk of disillusionment and exhaustion. Neglecting physical and psychological well-being can begin to catch up on staff. Moral distress and injury are also a risk. After the action phase has passed, there is a phase of recovery. Many staff experience personal growth, but some may experience guilt or shame. They may feel disconnected with their job and resentment towards individuals and or their organisation. Over time, individual difficulties can have wider family and social impacts, which can act to exacerbate the problems. A key message of the BPS guidance is that protecting psychological well-being of staff is possible through taking the appropriate steps during each of the phases. It's neither necessary nor appropriate to take the approach of simply picking up the pieces at the end of the crisis. So I'm going to move on now to the discussion itself. As I mentioned, I was joined by Dr Julie Highfield and two of the other members of the BPS Expert Reference Group, Dr Elaine Johnson and Dr Bob Maunder. We were joined by healthcare professionals from a range of backgrounds, some of whom had extensive experience in critical care. Others, who like many staff at the moment, have moved out of their usual specialty and or returned to practice in order to contribute to the response to the crisis. I'd really like to let you hear each of the members of the panel introduce themselves, but if you do want to skip forward, just jump forwards for seven and a half minutes. I'm, I'm a, a consultant clinical psychologist, Julie Highfield in Cardiff ICU. Um, I know most of the faces here, but not everyone from, from my work over the years. Um, and in the midst of this COVID crisis, um, I've worked with both the Intensive Care Society and the BPS in writing some guides and some how-tos, trying to really uh, spread the wellbeing word out there so um so that's me great thanks judy sandy 
and then I'll come Hi. to Catherine. Hi, Anya. Hi, I'm Sandy Mather. I'm Chief Executive of the Intensive Care Society and the least qualified person around this call, I think, to be talking. So I shall limit my contributions. <laughs> um, so we're responsible for the 3,500 uh, members and also the wider critical care community. We're a charity and our membership is really diverse. It is the whole of the multi-professional critical care team. So we're there for everyone, whether you're a member or not a member. It's part of our charitable remit to look after you all. Thanks, Andy. Um, Catherine, and then I'll come to Karen. I'm Catherine Plowry. I'm um, one of the uh, professional advisors on the British Association of Critical Care Nurses. Uh, we've been quite active recently, uh, trying to raise the profile of education for, our, for all of our members and non-members. Um, we've got um, quite a healthy looking um, uh, website with free educational uh, advice for the staff, uh, for people to look at, I should say. My background is ITU and outreach, and for the last two years I've been working on the uh, acute medicine on the, um, at the emergency sort of front door, really. So, yeah, quite a, a wide variety of stuff. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Karen, and then I'll come to Louise. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Karen. I am, um, like uh, Karen, sit on the British Association of Critical Care Nurses Board. I happen to be the conference director, um, and I've been involved in putting together some of the resources that's on there um, with regards to helping um, staff that is coming into intensive care without an ICU background. Um, right. Um, my day-to-day -day job is I'm an advanced nurse practitioner for critical care um, and I've been a critical care nurse for 27, 28 years working between ICU and outreach. Great, thanks Karen. Louise and then Elaine. Hi, my name's um, Louise State and I work with Catherine and Karen on the British Association of Critical Care Nurses. I'm one of the professional advisors as well, so we've been busy putting together uh, educational and learning resources um, for the website. Um, and I've been doing the same thing in, in my day job. I'm a senior lecturer in critical and specialist care at Oxford Brookes University as well. Um, so I've been putting together learning resources to prepare um, nurses going into critical care there for there as well. Great. Thanks, Louise. Elaine, and then I come to Matt. Hi, I'm Elaine Johnston. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in critical care in London um, at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. And um, prior to that, I've worked in various health specialties and also in crisis and trauma work for quite a number of years. And I'm also on the British Psychological Society Crisis Disaster and Trauma Section Committee, which is a bit of a mouthful, CDT. Um, so really pleased to be involved in the, this group. Thank you. Thanks Elaine. Matt and then I'll come to Bob. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Morgan. I'm an intensive care consultant based in Cardiff alongside Julie Highfield and my role over the last few weeks really has been trying to deliver critical care to patients with COVID-19. Great, thanks Matt. <coughs> Bob and then I'll come to Sean. Uh, hi, I'm Bob Monder. I'm a psychiatrist in Toronto, in Canada, um, and was involved in quite a bit of research after SARS on the impact of that event on people who worked in hospitals. And so I've been involved again in trying to support our um, staff and physicians through uh, COVID. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Shonda, and then I'll come to Reshan. Hi, my name is Shonda Ha. I'm an intensive care consultant based at Preston. Um, I've been involved in delivering critical care to COVID patients in Preston and critical care to patients who don't have COVID, which is surprisingly few in this at the moment in time. Mm. Um, so I've just come off shift. So uh, it'll be quite interesting to see what comes from this chat. Thanks, John. Great to have you. Uh, Reshim and then last but not least, Helen. Um, so thank you for having me. I am Rish and I am a consultant cardiologist and I am the true interloper in this group because I am neither critical care nor ITU nor a psychologist. Um, so uh, I am the amateur um, who is uh, desperately trying to help in any way that I can. Oh, thank you. I was invited by Elaine because I work at Chelsea and Westminster and we're trying to set up a group whereby we can communicate with the relatives of the ITU patients to try and ease the burden 
of the ITU team. Oh, thanks, Reshma. It's really great to have you. And I was saying you came in very much at the last minute, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, and oh, she's going, <laughs> don't go. And, and last but definitely not least, Helen. Right, hi. Um, so um, also vying for the amateur slot here. So uh, my name is Helen. I'm actually a consultant uh, clinical geneticist, which is about as non-acute speciality in medicine as, it, as it's possible to be. Um, and I haven't been working in the NHS for, um, since 2017 um, because I've taken a career break. I'm doing a, a master's. Um, but at, towards the beginning of this year, I thought, actually, it's time to go back to medicine. I need to refresh my NHS experience. So I, I thought it would be a good idea to sign up as a, as a locum doctor, um, coinciding with the COVID crisis. So I've been working for the last month um, in a&E on the acute medical unit at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, it's, it's been pretty busy. We, we've see, we are amongst the first line you know, to see um, COVID patients as they're coming in through the, the front doors. Um, and so for a, a um, out of work geneticist, uh, I, I've, I've really had to kind of uh, up my skills really very rapidly. I'm, I'm working as a junior doctor. Um, in, in, in which is a, the level of my acute practical skills. Thanks Helen and thanks also for joining us. Um, so uh, I, I'm the president of the BPS, my background just happens to be I'm a clinical psychologist and I've worked for about 30 years as a clinical psychologist in acute hospital settings. Um, so uh, it was quite fortunate I'm at BPS president at this time so I sort of have a bit more of a background than, than some previous president so I'm leading our BPS COVID um, response and was on the um, guideline group with um, Julie. I think Julian, do we, do we allow in? Do you, do you want to kick off the first part of the discussion Julie? Yeah sure I, I guess um, just starting that that thought of um, sort of what's our natural coping resources within this and, and to, to quote Jill Mabin, um, we are all good at death, dis disease and distress. This is our, our kind of core day job, but this is obviously it's on overdrive, isn't it? In terms of the speed and in terms of um, some of the, the particular cases that we're seeing. And certainly I think in, in terms of what we're the, the difficult choices people are having to make over treatment or, or not. Um, and I, I think um, what I was quite struck by, um, and I'm just thinking about um, some of Matt's comments in this over email, is that I think there are a lot of people, um, certainly more our ICU colleagues, who feel like they are quite well equipped and quite well built for this kind of work because that's the kind of career they chose in the first place. So should we, should we, I mean, it's, it's an interesting place to start. One of the sort of things that people mentioned was about positive emotions. And we, we mentioned that in the, um, in, in the guidance that a lot of people are feeling actually really kind of charged up and quite enjoying the work and, and, you know, and maybe not even feeling able to kind of talk about that so much. I don't know if that... I, I think that there is something, several people have contacted me quietly and said, is it wrong that I feel good? right now is it wrong that i'm enjoying my job right now so i'd be interested in different people's perspective on that anyone <laughs> matt you oh go on louise oh sorry um no i, I was just going to say um i mean people do have the skills to deal um with what's coming at them and and it's good that people feel have confidence to use those skills particularly in different settings um, so I'm not surprised that some people are feeling quite satisfied with their job because they're being presented a challenge in a very supported environment and they're able to um, utilize their skills in, the, in an optimal way so it doesn't surprise me at all um, but I think the key thing with the enjoyment is that they are supported in that role. Um, it's that kind of high challenge, high support kind Absolutely. of thing. Yeah. So it's kind of high demand, but also having the resources to meet that demand, both both personal and, and system. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess from, from my perspective, working in critical care, I think it's true actually that the job and the role now is very different than it has been just a month ago. 
And perhaps some of that joy or some of that enjoyment comes from being able to concentrate on really impactful things without so much worrying about a lot of the, the overheads which, which were there before, perhaps. I guess it is slightly hard to talk about that joy in work, and I also find it slightly hard to talk about that joy out of work. You know, it was my wife's birthday yesterday, she was 40, the sun was shining, it was a day off, uh, and yet when I you know, see people from a distance walking my dog, I almost feel as if I shouldn't be smiling and enjoying the weather because they know it's a tough time for healthcare and for other workers. Um, so I guess I, I kind of liked the permission in the guidelines that you guys wrote almost to say, look, that's OK. You still need to find joy in, in life as well as work. Yeah, I want to also um, add something that, to that as well, because I, I live with an infectious diseases physician um, and they've been saying for ages that uh, a, a, a global pandemic is due. And it, it's almost like at first, it's, it's like they look forward to it because it's a chance to test their skills. Um, certainly we, we had um, monkeypox in Liverpool and um, Ebola. And for the first few cases, it's like, oh, this is really exciting. This is what, what we, we trained for. You know, we, we can handle this. Um, I, I think it's just the sheer numbers. And, and also there's a scare factor here because this is so unpredictable. It, can, it has a sort of personal um, scare because it can affect any of us. It's not just people that have been traveling or people that have been cont contact. You, you actually, you know, every, all, all of us are at risk. So I think this does feel very, very different. But at, at, at the start for the infectious diseases guys, there's no doubt that they were pleased to have something to do and pleased to be able to kind of press the red button on their surge rotor. It, it, it felt quite exciting up to a certain point when it, it's, it's scary. I think that I think that's really interesting. If, if we'd had a chance to show you our lovely slides, um, the, there's three sort of stages, preparation, action and recovery. And the action phase is split into two. And I, mm -hmm. I found these lovely sl slides, which now I can't show you. But um, one is the first sort of part of the action is, uh, I forget what you called it, Julie, but it's sort of a sprint. And I've got pictures of sprinters. And then the second part is... Um, like a sort of I've got a slide of people in a cross-country race covered in mud and it's like you know that sort of you know the the, the uh, track runs out and you realize that actually you know it's not a sprint it's a it's a marathon and and you know things start getting on top of you and actually some of the plans don't work and I think you know the reality is that you know sometimes people don't you know, they, they, they don't feel they've got the skills, they don't feel they've got the resources, they don't feel they've got the skills, and, and they do feel that balance is tipped in, in, in favour of, of being out of control. And I think that is a reality. And sometimes, I guess, you know, people, you know, might be in those different stages at the same time. So some people might be feeling joyful and some people might be feeling, you know, overwhelmed. And it, it is, I think, important to recognise that people are going to be different in this. But I think, you know, the reality is that some people are going to be feeling incredibly overwhelmed. So, so the way I describe that middle phase is one part heroics and surge and the other part the, the kind of disillusionment. Um, and I, I think what, what we see is, is the surge and the joy and the kind of, oh, they're finally lifting all the red tape and they're listening to us and we can push things forward. And finally, you know, we don't have detox anymore. All those kinds of things is moving how it should. But then at the same time, I think um, this isn't a, a, a bombing. This is a six months plus who who knows this is a long haul and it's how much we keep up that energy and that joy mm. and how much we then start to really tire and get exhausted with this and i i think that that's a, a key part isn't it really because yeah there, there's a surge to joy but can, can we maintain that um sense of achievement in what we do especially as things get more stretched and and uh, things are more difficult over time. Oh, Karen, one thing about... Oh, sorry, just I'll uh, come to Karen and then come to you, Sean. Yeah. And somebody gave me a good analogy the other day. Um, this is the major incident that never stops. Mm. Um, so we're very well trained in getting, you know, when the major incident bleep goes off, things <laughs> is clearly falls in place, everything stops. Um, you make um, critical care capacity, you make theatre capacity, and this is what we've been doing, and we've been getting all these major incident um, patients in. 
but it doesn't stop. Where a normal major incident tends to go for 24, 48 hours, or the ones we tend to be involved with, um, and then you can you kind of go back to normal. Um, and it's really stressful at the time, but you do get joy out of helping um, the people that was involved with it. And you're really supportive and everything, everybody pulls together, but this doesn't stop. We've got no end in sight. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm worried about how people are gonna cope right. um, for any length of time because we've got no end in sight. Sure, uh, Sean, do you, do you come in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, intensive care consultants, you have to remember, are control freaks. Most of them went into it because we had a sick patient, we had all the gear we wanted to use, and we had a patient that we thought we could make better. With, to the best of our ability, with the best staff we could find, with the best equipment. And this is not controllable. And that's the bit that mm. you sit there going, oh, hold on a minute. I know I wanted a lot of extra beds and a lot of extra patients, I didn't want them all now. I didn't want it to continue for the next six months and then to put worse and worse resources into trying to mitigate it. So I think there's that, there's that loss of control over what's going on at a very high level and how, you know, in terms of care has been based on history, you know, how we used ventilators, how we provided nursing care, uh, what kind of people we treated. Um, you know, this will, this will do, give you good things, but I think a lot of people are very worried that this is going to give you a lot of bad traditions as well that may look economically viable, but we probably don't think are in the best interest of the patients in the long run. I was just interested in how, um, how as, as sort of doctors and nurses in, in this group, I don't think there's any AHPs, are there? You're all doctors. No, unfortunately, I tried, we tried to, but yeah. We sort of I I just wondered particularly how you know the sort of frontline doctors and nurses and also the doctors and nurses who are coming in and supporting teams who perhaps haven't worked in that area for a while or or at all even sometimes. I'm just wondering how you're coping with that loss of control and and feeling that it's overwhelming and that it's out of control. It, are, are there things that you have found that are kind of keeping you going or things that colleagues have shared with you or that you perhaps share with your juniors? I think that's something that um, Helen talked about. She talked about the fear factor. Now, um, in previous uh, situations, Ebola, SARS, MERS, they were very short-lived and very few people have ever, ever heard of them. This thing, absolutely every member of your village, your town, your city knows about it. Everybody knows that you work in a hospital and then they start to work out where you work. It just adds to the, the whole the whole fear thing. So I think that's, go back to your question there, Elaine, I don't know how you do that because actually every day you have to deal with it differently because every day you have a different team with you that, than you had the day before and you might not get the same people all, all the time. And some of our nurses are reporting to be looking after um, six patients to one intensive care nurse with, with um non-critical non care nurses looking after the others so that just all adds to that continual pressure and fear and yes some people might finish the day thinking good we've survived but we're starting to hear stories through the BACCN of people not feeling like that. Mm. kind of experience can can communicate to them i guess one thing that's come through already is the discussion is that you know that the the sort of emotions will vary so you know even within a day you might feel that joy and feeling in control and then at other times you might be feeling completely overwhelmed and i guess that that's you know it, uh, to quote julie's words it's okay to not feel okay that 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 is normal in this scenario and it may be that people aren't sharing that either the, the joy or the feeling completely overwhelmed. So I think that, and, and normalizing those responses is something we picked up in the guidelines. Anything else that, that people... Um, just to, to talk about um, newer nurses and more junior nurses and, and thinking about um, life before COVID and, and my general staff wellbeing role and actually what I would see um, in nurses who were struggling at work is when they would feel like they were being asked to do something beyond their competence or they, were, they actually were working well within their competence but they didn't believe in it and it's their own confidence and I think this is something that 
that um, really comes from the peer support um, and maybe somewhat the clinical leadership as well is to look out for these nurses and to really give them a sort of sense of um, you're doing the best you can to the best of your abilities to the resources that we have because there is a a little phrase I say is is in critical care we're all critical of each other and and I think we can be really hard on ourselves and I, what worries me is junior staff being extra hard on themselves um, and that's why we really need to to look out for each other um, during this time because it's it's easy to kind of get caught up in what we're doing and, and not think about what's going on for them. I think Bob was going to come in and, yeah. and then I, I just wanted to, to broaden that a little bit because I, 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 I want to be careful that I don't assume that my experience is like your experience because we're, we're in a pretty different situation here. Um, but that sense of um, being a little bit over your head or beyond your uh, competence, it doesn't just reside with junior staff. Right, that I've, I've seen many examples of pretty, of pretty experienced senior people who feel like they're being pushed out of their comfort zone, either because of redeployment or just because of clinical circumstances or because of uh, dreading whatever uh, they anticipate is going to come next. So it's, um, uh, it's not just young people who are feeling like they're, um, uh, they're not making the grade. Thanks, so that's really helpful, Bob, yeah. I was going to say as well that we 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 not focus one of the people we don't engage properly are the ones that we're having to protect from COVID. So there's a load of staff that are having to can't come into work or having to treat patients that aren't engaged. And conversations with them, they just they they feel terrible about it. And but there's actually so much that we can get them to do outside of it that helps. And it's it's how we get how we deal with that frustration for them and how we get them to engage as well and that'll be really helpful i think that this is where and i wonder about what you're managing to do elaine and, and Resham. this is where in cardiff we're making um making use of our, our more and um, they're not fully shielded nurses well some of them are but um making use of our, our nurses that need to be in the cold zone or are more um vulnerable and they're running the family support hub um, so actually they're using their skills that they would have been using at the bedside, but over the phone, talking to families, updating families. Um, and actually people are, are, are really, one, families are really responsive to that. And two, the nurses feel like I'm contributing, I'm being useful, I'm using my skill. Um, and we've actually got a couple of people who are shielded, who we're, we're being able to share the information via Hospify and get them to ring people from home. So they still feel very much part of, of, of the work. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that, that strikes me as really important is, is really being able to see the different roles in a team and not just focusing on the people at the sort of, you know, at, at the front end of it. Um, how, I think, and then Helen. No, I think that's a, a really important point that there's a lot of fear out there and it's pervasive, but there's also a lot of sense of guilt for a lot of people that they can't contribute as much as they would normally like. And then um, looking in at my critical care colleagues, they are clearly normally extremely self-critical. And I think one of the things they're really struggling with is that they feel they're not able to deliver the care that they know they are capable of delivering. And I think that day after day after day, you can see that that's taking a toll. And we're working in teams that are very, very fluid with people we don't really know that well. Um, and we all have stress responses. And it's really challenging to A, be um, mindful and aware of where I as an individual am at any one moment and how stressed I am and how that's impacting on other people who are also extremely stressed, particularly people I may not know that well. Mm. well that's really helpful, uh, Helen, did you want to come in? Yeah, yes, I just want, to, so I was talking to some um, nurses on our, our acute medical unit um, because uh, we just found out that there was an, an, a new national phone number for uh, NHS staff well-being. Um, so I said, oh, you know, is anyone, you know, is any, you know, do you think anyone will, 
or, or use this. And they, they, the group of nurses all said, well, no, we've got each other. So we'll be all right. We just talk to each other. And I thought, well, that's, that's lovely. Um, that, that's, that sound, it sounded really lovely and really supportive. But how do you know if there's a, an, a, so an individual who's not within that group um, who is going to be vulnerable and isn't going to have that level of peer support be because I, I doubt whether everybody will be within the group so finding the the, the, the outliers if, if you like and making sure they have support is kind of harder. No I think both of those points are really helpful and actually sort of takes on to that thing about peer support and and I think as, as Reshim said a bit I mean they're both related in is Reshim's point of you're going into a team where you don't know people how can you sort of help that team to peer support to happen and make sure no one falls through through the gaps and I mean I'm sure you'll all have some kind of perspective on that. One of the things we're um, looking at in, in our hospital is um, trying to find staff who could act as a kind of well-being champion within a team and to make sure that the the team clinical lead or shift leader also does a check-in with staff around their well-being um, so that it so that it becomes um, just part of usual practice to be to be doing that, and that they can then signpost them on to support. Whether that's an informal chat with a colleague who can support them that that is perhaps not so involved in a frontline role, or whether it's um, formal helplines. That there's a national helpline. We're fortunate to also have a, a, a local um, psychology supported helpline in our hospital. Not it, not everywhere does. Um, but just being able to make use of some of the intensive care society tips and resources and things as well. But I think sometimes it's just that reminder for people that actually, you know, you're caring for other people and you to be able to do that, you have to look after yourself as well. And, and being, um, being stressed does affect, um, uh, you know, your, your ability to, to be compassionate to yourself, to your colleagues, to your patients. So we're really, really trying to look at how we get that in the structure. And I was quite interested in what other people's experience have been of actually how they've actually implemented that in their uh, areas. If they have, that was a question really. Bob, did you want to come in? Yeah, so uh, one, of the things, one of the things that we found over the years in all kinds of circumstances is that um, uh, support provided by somebody you know or a connection to support provided by somebody you know is just so much more effective than trying to connect with a stranger. And so we've, in the midst of this, um, uh, we've established what we call coaches who are mostly psychiatrists uh, who are not doing their usual psychiatry gig, who uh, uh, are instead spending an hour or two a day in the ICU or the emergency department or the hotter medical units or with whichever parts of the building kind of identify themselves as, as uh, potentially benefiting from that kind of support. And they attend huddles or they go to Zoom meetings or they go to rounds if they're still rounds. Um, but it kind of doesn't matter what they do. Like the most important thing is that they're just kind of establishing a presence and some relationship. And it's much, it's easier to identify who might need some support within that department, but it's also much easier for them to approach Mary or Bob or John than to uh, pick up a phone and call a number and not sure who's going to be on the other end. Um, I, I'll come to Chond in a sec. I, I, I'm, I'm struck by, in a crisis, how, how, how important peer support is, but also how quickly peer bonds can, can establish. I mean, I've only really known Julie for I've had three weeks, and I feel like I've known her my whole life now, um, because we've sort of thrown together in this work. And I, I think that may be an experience. And so I think sometimes just create facilitating the sort of expectation that people can come together and that there is an expectation that you buddy and you support someone actually though those bonds can form very quickly in a, in a crisis and as you say that can be more effective than than sort of a, a remote um somebody you don't know but uh, sean do come in sorry i was just i was just thinking what bob had just said i, I mean he was talking about huddles and i think we found that a hugely effective way of getting people to know each other right and and not just your kind of 
your clinical stuff. But we, you know, when we do our huddles, we have our ward clerks, our pharmacists. So, you know, we've had librarians in our huddles before. And uh, you need to only need to do it two or three times with two or three different groups. And there's individuals from each group will be in, in other huddles. And so we found that that's a really effective way of communicating. I mean, I used to, I used to think it would, I mean, until, I think in normal practice, it can get in your way. But for this, it's, it's a very rapid way of providing communication and support. And, and it's very clear early on, especially in small groups, like five or six people, who, who need support. So I, I think that's, it's, a, it's, it's been a great help that. That's really helpful, uh, Sean. I want to move on, but just before I do that, you've, you've tapped into a point that's really, really important, I think, and that has come out in the guidance, that actually sometimes, and, and you know, we can see the makeup of this group, we think about doctors and nurses, but actually we know that, that you know, healthcare is a team and it's clinical and non-clinical. And the research shows us that it's often the sort of more peripheral people in the team that do experience the more distress and certainly um, people in admin roles and, and um, you know, other roles can, can actually be more likely to, to show distress. So it, those kind of huddles and support mechanisms have to be inclusive and have to bring people in. I think that's, that's so important. 